Okay, here, let's see here. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, the other day uh, during lecture, you know, again, um, because of sort of the exam and stuff we had last week and, and so forth, uh, just to kind of keep us on pace, again, I, I did record uh, basically two uh, chapter seven lectures. The first one covers um, basically balancing equations and types of reactions. Uh, the second one there covers uh, grams and moles, Avogadro's number and stoichiometry. Um, I, I did want to take some time here and kind of go over some of the highlights or at least touch upon some of the topics there that are in those chapters. And, uh, you know, just maybe answer any questions that you might have on that. Um, again, make sure you do watch those as you're responsible for, obviously, that material as well. Um, if you have any questions on anything else, when I'm done here, I'd be more than happy to you know, answer those questions as well. So uh, why don't we kind of get into some of the topics there from uh, Chapter 7. Um, basically, Chapter 7 really dealt with... Uh, chemical reactions and chemical equations. And um, basically we talked about balancing them. Uh, we then talked about different ways to classify reactions. And then we talked about grams and moles and how to basically put all those together and do what is referred to as stoichiometry, which is calculations uh, from chemical equations. So really, Chemical equations, uh, chemical reactions, a reminder, those are really, you know, chemical changes. And when we have chemical changes, remember basically what we start with and what we sort of end with are fundamentally uh, different things. And what we, the way that we represent uh, sort of a chemical change or a chemical reaction is obviously uh, we use a chemical equation. And chemical equations are really important. Uh, so for example, if we had C3H8 plus O2, CO2 plus some water, this is an equation. Um, this is what is referred to as an unbalanced equation here. Um, but there are certain parts to a chemical equation which are important. Everybody on the left-hand side of the arrow, again, these are what are re referred to as reactants, which are really your starting material in a chemical reaction. Everybody on the right-hand side of the arrow, uh, these guys here are what are referred to as products, which are obviously uh, the things that are produced as a result of a chemical reaction. Uh, other things that are, are sometimes included next to formulas, for example, are the states like solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. That's what the AQ stands for, it stands for aqueous. It means really a, a water environment. And I think we maybe have touched upon this before, but just to, again, distinguish between liquid and something that's aqueous, a liquid is something that basically is just a pure liquid, uh, which basically means <clears throat> that uh, for something like water. So if you just have pure water by itself, uh, that is considered a liquid. If you take something like water and put some sodium chloride in it, like salt, and it dissolves, that will make salt water, which is an aqueous solution. So solutions are basically aqueous. And it usually is a result of taking something like water and putting something in it and dissolving it. And that's the difference between something that's aqueous and a liquid. So very common, we see those states next to the formulas. Also, the arrow is also a place where we see a lot of things sometimes written. Uh, sometimes you'll see like a delta symbol, a little triangle. That usually means that heat is being applied. Um, you'll maybe sometimes see a catalyst written on top, uh, maybe something like PT, maybe something like H plus. Uh, a catalyst is not a reactant. It's not a product. And it does not get used up. It 
in the reaction. A catalyst is typically there simply to make the reaction occur faster. Uh, so it usually is added to speed up a chemical reaction. So, um, you know, a lot of things are sometimes written on top of the arrow, sometimes as well. You know, you might even see water written up on top of the arrow. And that usually implies that you took something and dissolved it in water. We also sometimes will use chemical equations for processes that, you know, are not necessarily a chemical change or chemical reaction, but a more physical change. Like, for example, we may sometimes use an equation to show water, for example, going from the solid state to water going to the liquid state. This, again, is a physical process that can be represented here by this uh, equation, basically ice going to liquid water. So, you know, we can use equations for both physical sort of changes and chemical changes, although they are usually reserved for more uh, chemical changes. Any questions on that there? Now, we use an equation, an equation is pretty much useless to us unless it is balanced. And you always wanna make sure that you balance equations um, and you wanna make sure that they are balanced before you use them. We balance equations by only changing the coefficients, which are the numbers that come in front of a formula. We never ever change the subscripts because those guys would then change what it is. Uh, we never do anything weird like putting a big number in between two elements or anything like that, but we always change the coefficients. When it's all said and done, and if you have properly balanced an equation, there's really a couple of things that needs to be done. Basically, all of the coefficients should be whole numbers. And not only should they be whole numbers, but they also should be the simplest set of whole numbers. And what I mean by that is perhaps you are balancing an equation like, you know, A plus B goes to, you know, C. And this was a coefficient of four. This was a coefficient of six. Uh, this was a coefficient of eight. And maybe this didn't represent it being balanced. If we look at the coefficients, although it would technically be a balanced equation, uh, we technically could go through each of these coefficients and divide by two, and that would give us 2a plus 3b goes to 4c. And this would be the properly balanced equation because we reduced it down to all whole numbers. So this sometimes happens when people balance equations. Sometimes people can see larger numbers that gets an equation balance. Um, but if there's a possibility to go through an equation and reduce down all the coefficients to whole numbers, then you definitely should do that to have a properly balanced equation. And all of those numbers, like I mentioned earlier, uh, do need to be whole numbers in order for uh, it to be really properly balanced. So if we look at, for example, the one I wrote up here, this equation is not balanced. A, I don't see any numbers there, which is sometimes a good indication, not always, but sometimes a good indication that perhaps it's not balanced. When we go to balance something like this, A good way of doing it really is to make a table of what's present on the reactant side and the product side. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. On the left-hand side, I see I have three carbons. Right-hand side, I have one. Left-hand side, I have eight hydrogens. Right-hand side, I have two. Left-hand side, I have two oxygens. Uh, Right-hand side, I have two there, plus one more there is three. So when I look at this table, it kind of helps me decide where to go first. I can see probably pretty easily I could balance the carbon on the right-hand side 
by again, simply putting a number in front, like a three. And when I do that, that now gives me three carbons. Hydrogen is still two. Oxygen in the first guy, I got three times two, which is six, plus one more in the second guy here, gives me seven. So I've successfully balanced the carbon, but hydrogen and oxygen are still not balanced. Again, the easiest thing to probably fix at this point would be the hydrogen. I could fix the hydrogen on the right-hand side by putting, again, a number in front, which in this case, I'll choose four. Gives me three carbons, four times two is eight hydrogens. And now in the first guy here, I got three times two is six. And the second guy here, I got four times one, which is four. And that gives me 10 in terms of my oxygen. I now can turn to the left-hand side and see that the oxygen is not balanced there. And I can simply finish this up by putting a five over there. And that will now give me three carbons, eight hydrogens, five times two is 10 oxygens. This is now a balanced chemical equation. And again, 100% of the time, you should always be using a balanced equation uh, when you're doing it. Any questions on those steps there? Okay, uh, let's take a look here and see how we're doing. Uh, so again, like I mentioned before, I personally will usually make like a little table. You don't necessarily have to, but if it's helpful to you, go for it. Again, here we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen happening. Left-hand side, I got 10 carbons. Right-hand side, I got one. Left-hand side, I got 14 hydrogens. Right-hand side, I got two. Left-hand side, I got two oxygens. Uh, again, here, two there, and one more makes three in this case. Again, much like kind of the similar one we had previously, uh, probably carbon would be the simplest thing to fix. Again, we want to put a number in front. In this case, we'll go with 10. It gives me uh, 10 carbons. It gives me still two hydrogens. First guy now has 10 times two as we distribute that number. And that's 20. And then we have one more here. So that I believe is 21. The next easiest thing to fix probably would be the hydrogen on the right-hand side. Uh, we will put a seven up there and that's going to give us again, 10 carbons, uh, seven times two as we distribute here and also here, seven times two is uh, 14 for our hydrogens. First guy still has 20 oxygens. Second guy has seven times one, which is uh, seven. And that is uh, 27 oxygens. We obviously don't want to touch anything on the right-hand side. The only oxygen that we see here on the left-hand side is here. And we basically need to turn that into a 27. There's clearly no number that you can multiply perhaps a two by the, directly. That's a whole number that will get you to 27 but this is a situation where you could use a fraction and a fraction, something like 27 over two. And if I did that on the left-hand side, I would have 10 carbons, 14 hydrogens. And when I take 27 over two and distribute it times this number, the twos cancel and I end up with 27 oxygens, which means that technically speaking, this one is balanced, but technically speaking, it is incorrectly balanced because if you remember when you have successfully balanced an equation, you should have all whole numbers. So we absolutely can use a fraction to help us balance an equation, but we cannot leave it as a fraction uh, to represent the actual balance equation. So what that means is we do need to go through and basically multiply everybody, not just a fraction, by the denominator here. And if we do that, we will end up with 2C10H14s plus 
27 times two is 27 oxygens. To the other side, two times 10 is 20 CO2s plus two times seven is 14 H2Os. And again here, if I did not screw anything up here, we should still be uh, balanced in this case. So let's take a look and see if we are. On the left-hand side, now on the bottom equation, two times 10 is 20. Right-hand side for carbon is 20. Hydrogen on the bottom, two times 14 is 28. Right-hand side, 14 times two is 28 hydrogens. Oxygen is 27 times two is 54. In the first one here, we have 20 times two, which is 40. And in the second one, we have 14 times one, which is 14. For 40 and 14 is 54. This would be the balance equation. So again, this is a, an example of, you absolutely can use a fraction to balance it. And it oftentimes will happen in a situation like this, where we see kind of the molecular version of an element all by itself, especially a diatomic element. And we see that element in a couple of things on the other side. It's a very common situation as sometimes a fraction is needed uh, to balance it. A reminder that in choosing your fraction, the top number is always the number you need. So if you remember back here, we needed 27. And the bottom number should always match this guy, the subscript. So that should match the subscript. So it cancels out. Any questions on balancing equations? <clears throat> Professor, this is yeah. also covered in your uh, lecture seven, right? Or the, the ones you did? Okay. It is, yeah. So I just I just wanted to kind of in person touch upon some of these topics, but yeah, it's absolutely in there. That's for sure. And is is this uh, being recorded too or not? It is, yes. It, okay, so we could come back and review it, right? Yep. Yep. All right. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Other questions? Yeah. Um. So you said that's twenty-seven over two times two, right? Yes. The times two is that the subscript as well? It, it, that's where the, the second two that you're talking about, I'm assuming, is here. Yeah. It, it, it comes from this because it's just like when we took the 10 and we had to multiply it by this two, we technically would be taking the 27 over two and multiplying it by the two on the left there. Yep. Same idea. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Uh, so that's a little bit of, again, like uh, was just asked. It, obviously, it, more examples and stuff in, in the recorded lecture. Uh, but that's a little bit about uh, balancing equations. Another topic that I want to kind of touch upon a little bit here in person is the idea of Avogadro's numbers and converting things to moles and, and those type of things. So first off, uh, we, we have a, a number which is known as Avogadro's number. And, you know, in life, we, we do have words that mean something. Like if we say we have a pair of something, that usually means we have two. Uh, if we have a dozen of something, right, that means we have 12. In chemistry, we have a word that basically is a mole, M-O-L-E. And the abbreviation for mole is M-O-L. They had to drop something, so they dropped the E. So when you do see M-O-L, it is the abbreviation for mole not molecules, which is a very common mistake. And when we say we have a mole of something, it does represent a certain amount. So just like when you say you have a pair of something, it's two. When you say in chemistry, I have a mole of something, it represents Avogadro's number. And Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And Kind of the weird thing about Avogadro's number is actually the units part of it. It can actually change units. And what I mean by that is sometimes, you know, you may be talking about particles. Sometimes you may be talking about atoms. Sometimes you may be talking about molecules. So 
for most part in chemistry, these two units are used a lot with Avogadro's number atoms or molecules. So for example, if I said I had one mole of hydrogen, that would mean that I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen, as hydrogen is just an atom here. If I said I had, uh, you know, one mole of whatever we were just looking at there, C10H14, I would say that I would then have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of C10H14. So the number stays the same, the units varies. And again, most commonly atoms are molecules or sort of what we use it in terms of units. And what we use Avogadro's number for is really a conversion to go from atoms or molecules to moles and backwards moles back to atoms or molecules. Now, sometimes people go like, should I use Avogadro's number everywhere? And the answer is no. You should really only use Avogadro's number if it mentions anything about atoms, if it mentions anything about molecules, that's where you should use Avogadro's number. There really is no mention of atoms or molecules or anything like that. Uh, then you should really leave Avogadro's number alone. So for example, if I said I had you know, 155 moles of sulfur, and I wanna know how many atoms of sulfur that would be, this is where I would use Avogadro's number. I would know that in one mole of sulfur, there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of sulfur. And really I can make two conversion factors from that. I could say one mole of sulfur over 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms are the opposite, like we do conversion factors, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms over one mole of sulfur. So in this case, we would just do a problem like we normally would like dimensional analysis here. We would take 155 moles of sulfur. We want to get rid of sulfur. So we want the moles of sulfur to be on the bottom, which would be here. And we would do one mole of sulfur is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. The moles of sulfur will cancel out. So we're basically taking 155 times 6.0. 2, 2 to the 23, and that would get us something like 9.33 times 10 to the 25 atoms of sulfur are present. So here we use Avogadro's number to go from moles to atoms in this particular case. Any questions on that calculation? Now, we can also, like I said before, sort of use it in the molecules version. So, you know, if we had 3.25 times 10 to the 32 molecules of, we'll just use the same guy, C10H14, and we wanted to know how many moles that was. Again, we could use Avogadro's number as a relationship that one mole of C10H14 would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And in this case, we would use molecules here because this is a molecule, C10H14, of this guy. And we would do our calculation just like the previous one. We would use that as our conversion factor. So in this case, we're starting with molecules of C10H4, which means we wanna put molecules on the bottom. So we would go with Avogadro's number in this case on the bottom. And one mole on top, which is what we're looking for, 
the molecules would cancel again using our exponent button 3.25 exponent button 32 divided by 6.022 exponent button 23 would tell us that we would end up uh, with 5.4022 times 10 to the 8 moles of C10H14. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so first thing is Avogadro's number uh, is basically what a mole represents, 6.022 times 10 to 23. We use it again as a conversion factor to go from atoms are molecules to moles or backwards moles are moles to molecules are atoms again if there's no mention of either atoms or molecules you definitely should not be using Avogadro's number in the calculation the other really important sort of calculation was uh, molar mass and molar mass does come from the periodic table it has units of grams per mole, it's always, the number always stays with the grams and it's always per one mole. And we use this really as a conversion factor to go from grams to moles or moles back to grams. Where do we get the molar mass from? We actually get the molar mass from the periodic table. And again, if you look at the periodic table, kind of like what we were doing earlier today, for example, uh, nitrogen, we'll say something like 14.01. That is the molar mass for nitrogen, which means that there are 14.01 grams per mole for nitrogen. Uh, if you looked up copper, you would see 63.55, I believe. And uh, that means that in copper, there are 63.55 grams per one mole. And that would be the molar mass of copper. Typically, when we take these numbers off the periodic table, there's a lot more numbers that are present. We typically take it to four significant figures. So typically speaking, you pull off four significant figures, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from the periodic table there uh, to get your molar mass. And we could really use uh, the molar mass as like a conversion factor. So for example, for copper, we could really use it both ways, 63.55 grams per mole. And if we want to do sort of like a dimensional analysis sort of problem, uh, we could flip it around and put the moles on top and the 63.55 grams on the bottom. If you were asked the question, what is the molar mass of copper, the correct answer would be the 63.55 grams per mole. Um, but again, we could kind of use it as a conversion factor. So if I had, for example, um, say 35 grams of copper, and I want to know how many moles that, that is, I would start with my 35 grams of copper. I would use the molar mass from the periodic table where the grams would cancel, which means I would want to use this version of it grams on the bottom, moles on top, that way the grams do cancel. And we end up with <clears throat> 35 divided by 63.55, and that gets us 0 0.551 moles of copper in this case. So that's again, a very common sort of uh, <clears throat> conversion that we do. To tie this into sort of Avogadro's number as well, there would be 63.55 grams of copper is equal to one mole of copper, and one mole of copper would equal 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms of copper. So let's just say, for example, we want to also know how many atoms of copper that would be. We could continue on with our calculation and use Avogadro's number to get us there. 
uh, which would be 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms per mole. So moles would cancel. And we would see that in the 35 grams of copper, that would represent 0.551 moles of copper. And that would also represent somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.32 times 10 to 23 atoms of copper, a lot of copper atoms floating around. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Now, we also could do molar mass, not just for like an individual element, but we could also do it for a molecule as well. So let's just say C3H8. And let's just say that we wanted to know um, <clears throat> how many grams there are in 33.5 moles of C3H8. So here we have moles and we have grams. So that tells us it is the molar mass that we want to use to do that conversion to go from basically grams to moles. So to do the molar mass of this, we do have to go to the periodic table and we have to look up carbon, which we see 12.01. We also have to look up hydrogen, which we see 1.008. And basically to get the molar mass of a molecule, we just add up all the parts. So there are three carbons, each at 12.01 grams per mole. There are eight hydrogens, each at 1.008 grams per mole. And that tells us that we have three times 12.01 plus eight times 1.008 tells us that the molar mass of this compound is 44.09 grams per mole. We again could use this as a conversion factor. So we will start with our calculation here, 33.5 moles. Again, we wanna get rid of moles. So we'll put the grams on, on top the moles on the bottom, which obviously come from the periodic table. The moles here will cancel and we would end up uh, with about 1477 grams of C3H8. Roughly probably should end up somewhere like 1480 grams with significant figures of C3H8 question on that calculation there. <clears throat> now, again, a reminder that, you know, if we wanted to know molecules or something like that, then we would use Avogadro's number and this guy. Um, but in this case, we were just looking for grams. Question on that calculation there. Another kind of thing that sometimes comes up is, for example, Let's say uh, taking the same guy here, 33.5 moles of C6H8. Let's say we want to know how many hydrogen atoms that is. So in this particular case, we're not interested in the entire thing here. We're actually just interested in the hydrogen part of it. We also see the word atoms, which tells us Avogadro's number is probably in play. So we need a way to go from the whole thing to each of the individual elements. And that's where these bottom numbers come into play. These bottom numbers are where sometimes referred to also as the moles of each of these guys. We could actually come up with a conversion factor where we could say in one mole of the entire thing, there would be six moles of just carbon. And again, the six comes from here. And we could also say in one mole, the entire thing, there would be eight moles of hydrogen. The eight comes from here. And we could really use that as a conversion factor to go from the whole thing to just hydrogen. So to show you how that works, we would take 33.5 moles of the whole thing and we do want to get rid of the whole thing. So we would use this relationship here. 
and we would go one mole of the whole thing on the bottom. So it cancels, gives us eight moles of hydrogen. And if we do that at that point, that gets us 33.5 times eight, gets us 268 moles of just hydrogen. We are again, not interested in the moles of hydrogen, but we actually want the atoms of hydrogen. So again, that is where our Avogadro's number could come into play. There are 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms in a mole of hydrogen. So we could finish this calculation by using Avogadro's number here. And again, with the keyword of moles in the problem here, I'm sorry, atoms in the problem, tells us that we do need to use it. The moles will cancel. So we take that times 6.022 to the 23, and we will end up with a very big number of, there are 1.61 times 10 to the 26 atoms of hydrogen in that particular compound. So sometimes in problems, uh, you're not interested in the whole thing in the formula, but you're interested in just one part of it. And we can use what is sometimes referred to as the mole-to-mole -mole relationship of the formula to help us do that. Obviously, in order to use this relationship, we have to make sure that this guy is also in moles so that everything cancels out correctly. Questions on kind of grams of moles, Avogadro's number, a couple few different applications of it. All right, so to finish up on some of those topics here from chapter seven, as we're getting to the end here, I did want to also touch upon stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is where we kind of put both of those things together, really the grams, the moles, the moles, the grams. And it allows us to, if we have an equation, use a balance equation to figure out things like if we ran this equation or reaction, you know, how much product would we produce if we threw in a certain amount of starting material or if we produce a certain amount of product, how much reactants would we start with? And there's really four steps for our type of stoichiometry problems. The first one is the most important. You do need to have a balanced equation. Nothing works correctly if you don't have a balanced equation. The second thing is whatever they give you, whatever is given to you, you want to convert to moles. So very commonly, you're given things in grams and you need to go to moles. Whereas we just talked about, you could use the molar mass to do that on the periodic table. At that point, you'll be in moles and you want to find the mole to mole relationship from the balanced equation. And that's from the equation. And then number four, you sometimes need to do, sometimes not. You want to take the moles and convert it to some other unit. Again, very commonly on the back end, moles back to grams using the molar mass is a very common way to do that. So for example, let's say we had a equation such as uh, do, um, C2H4 plus O2, CO2 plus some water. And let's say we produced 10 grams of water. How many grams of, we'll go with O2, did we start with? All right, so first things first, we wanna do the first part of stoichiometry, which is we wanna make sure that the equation is balanced. So if we look at this one, it is not balanced. I don't believe so. We'll throw some numbers in and see how we do. We'll put a two there, maybe a two there. That gives us uh, two carbons on both sides, four hydrogens on both sides. That also gives us uh, four oxygens and two is six and three. So now we are balanced there. So we got uh, six oxygens on both sides and we got uh, four hydrogens and two carbons. So that is check. 
The only thing that they gave us in terms of numbers is 10 grams of water. So we need to take what they gave us and convert it into moles. So we got to take the 10 grams of water and convert it to moles, which means we need to go to the periodic table. We need to look up hydrogen and see that hydrogen is 1.008. We'll also go there and look up oxygen, which is 16. And we will get the molar mass of water, which would be two times 1.008 for the hydrogen, are both hydrogens, plus 16 for the oxygen there. And if we do all that, we will see that we end up with two times 1.008 plus 16, 1802 grams per mole would be the molar mass of water. So we're going to use that to convert into moles. So we take the number they gave us, we do that molar mass conversion like we just talked about, 18.02 grams on the bottom, moles on top of water. That comes from the periodic table. And the grams will cancel. We take 10 divided by 18.02, gives us 0 0.5549 moles of water. So all we've done is taken what they gave us and convert it into moles. But we are now stuck here to number three. And the problem is we have moles of water, but we're not really interested in water. We want to ultimately know about oxygen. So this is the stoichiometry part and the third part of the calculation. We go to the equation and we find the two things we're interested in. One thing is what they gave us, which in this case is water. The other thing is what we're trying to find, which is oxygen. And from the equation, we could come up with what is referred to as the mole to mole relationship. And that is nothing more than the actual coefficients. So from the equation, we could see if we throw in there three moles of O2, we will get out two moles of H2O. That is what is referred to as the mole to mole relationship from the balance equation, which is why it's really important to balance your equation. And that will allow you to go from water to O2 in this case, which is what we're interested in. So let us do that part of the calculation here. We will take 0 0.5549 moles of water. And we're going to use this up here as a conversion factor. We want to get rid of water, which means from the equation, we see we put in there two moles of water. And we also put in there three moles of O2. This is the stoichiometry part. This allows us to get rid of water, which is ultimately what we're not interested in, and convert it into oxygen, which is what we are interested in. So 0 0.5549 times three divided by two, we now end up with 0 0.83235 moles of oxygen. Now we're in moles of oxygen, but we really don't want moles. We want to know how many grams of oxygen that is. So we do need to do number four here, which is to take the moles and convert those into grams. It's important to note that at this point, we're no longer dealing with water. We're dealing with oxygen, which means we need to go back to the periodic table and figure out the molar mass of O2. And if we do that, the molar mass of O2 is 2 times 16 grams per mole. Gives me 32 grams per mole as the molar mass of oxygen. And that would be our last step here. We would take our number from the previous step. We will use our molar mass in the opposite way here than we did earlier. We will put the grams up on top because that's what we're looking to end up with. The moles will come on the bottom. Again, this comes from the periodic table. 
This comes from the balanced equation. And if we do that, the moles of oxygen will cancel and we will end up uh, with 26.6 grams of oxygen. So basically what this number says is if I were doing this reaction and I put in there 26.6 grams of oxygen and everything went perfect in this reaction, I would expect to get out 10 grams of water produced. And that's how we were able to figure that out based on stoichiometry. Every single stoichiometry problem that you do are the same four steps. Balance the equation, convert what they gave you to moles, go to the equation, do the mole to mole relationship, and then convert from moles to grams or some other unit. Any questions on any of those steps there in a stoichiometry problem? Any questions on anything that we talked about here tonight? Okay, so I just again wanted to uh, kind of touch upon some of the stuff here from chapter seven. Again, please make sure you do watch those recorded videos um, as you are responsible for obviously the information that's in there. Um, and again, if you have questions along the way during next week's discussion or something, feel free to ask them. Uh, other than that, uh, we're kind of done with discussion, but if you still have questions on something else that I could help you with, 